When the pandemic first sneezed into the world's mouth in 2020, we were all forced to spend more time online. After nearly two years of this shit, we're now a planet populated by Amazon-addicted shopaholics, OnlyFans simpoids, and Zoom call zombies. I'm here live, but it's not, I'm not a cat. Meat space is integrating with the digital. Our cars, fridges, and wrists are all connected to the cloud, and Grindr's ex-boyfriend is sending tweets to the most remote places on Earth and to the inside of a macaque's skull. Like a frog boiling alive in hand sanitizer, my brain has probably bubbled from too much late-night doom scrolling. Be that as it may, I've noticed some trends online this year that I want to share with you. Think of this as the ordinary state of the internet address. 2021 has been open season for scammers, shitheels, and the surveillance state. Progress, though, moves like a train made of lasers, which is scary for those invested in the past. Legacy media has been busy trying to claw back some of its declining influence, and dictators worldwide are trying desperately to clap laptop screens shut. Inflation went from being transitory to transnational, allowing crypto-fascists and crypto-crazies to propose conflicting futures for the concept of cash. Supply chains got rusty, Time magazine got musky, and the QR code made a surprising comeback. The internet offers so much opportunity for innovation and cooperation. A dialed-in population is more easily informed, but also more easily observed. So let's observe ourselves, observing ourselves, and start in January 2021. The year started off with a bang on the door of the US Capitol, as America's reenactment of the sacking of Rome was performed by the kind of folks who'd usually spend their days snacking on pencil shavings. Live streaming and self-snitching all the way into Nancy Pelosi's office so the rest of us could watch democracy get upended live on Twitch. Make sure if you ever take over the Capitol or any other uh, big uh, place, make sure you bring a shield. You can't get this anywhere except for the cops' hands. All right, guys, thanks for watching. While democracy was getting shaken like an unwanted baby in America, over in Russia, one man was checking its pulse. To the surprise of everyone, Russia's hottest revolutionary comedian and YouTuber returned to Russia after mysteriously being poisoned and Putin a coma. One day after his arrival, sex Alexei Navalny was taken to prison and made to stand trial. Luckily for us though, he'd already filmed some fire content. Navalny's video on Putin's palace was merely a collection of previously available sources and cool ass drone shots reorganized to be both funny and informative. Many Russians had never heard what Navalny was repeating, and more still hadn't heard it from someone that they could maybe sort of trust. The investigation and his arrest led to mass protests in Russia on the 23rd, making a strong case for independent online media's ability to disrupt traditional power structures. This is something that Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni was clearly conscious of when he cemented his 35th year of consecutive power, winning his sixth straight election after imposing a five-day national internet shutdown. He was clearly rattled by opposition leader and Afrobeat singer Bobby Wine, who gained popularity with campaign songs What He Sung Himself. <laughs> Bobby still hasn't conceded the election, despite apparently losing it by over 50%. He claims that the president used the internet shutdown to hide election fraud and widespread human rights abuses. There's nothing to move on from in Uganda. Uganda is still under the tight, the tight grip of a military dictatorship under General Museveni. Unfortunately, this is a growing trend over the last few years, as authoritarian regimes use internet shutdowns to suppress information. In February, finding video game content on the front page of Twitch was harder than finding a fart in a jacuzzi, as hot tub streaming was the easiest loophole to sneak nearly pornographic content onto the platform. Jeff Bezos also announced that he would be stepping down as CEO so that he could spend more time with his rockets and muscles. At least in space, no one could hear him laugh. 
<laughs> in Australia, the government passed anti-tech legislation to calm the tantrums being thrown by media companies like the Murdoch-owned News Corp, forcing Google and Facebook to pay millions for the news content they were sharing for free on their platform. Facebook initially took down their newsfeed before relenting and throwing money at the problem until it went away. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of subsistence farmers in India marched on Delhi to protest agricultural reforms. Driving tractors and themselves onto the highway on a violent collision course with the police. The Indian government reacted as they often do, by shutting down the internet in 12 of the districts with close proximity to the protests. Over the last few years, India has easily secured the dubious record of most internet shutdowns in a country, although they have been mostly hyper-local and never countrywide. On the 1st of February, this fitness influencer went mega viral after accidentally capturing the beginning of Myanmar's military coup on the 1st of the month. What followed was the arrest of the country's democratically elected leader, and a near-total internet blackout to suppress protest and organisation. Though this didn't stop 20,000 people marching on the streets of Yangon. Nightly internet blackouts followed, along with a temporary ban on all social media, as the military killed protesters in cold blood. Repressive regimes understand that their greatest structural threat is the free internet and the brave young people of Myanmar are on the front line to protect that freedom. Meanwhile, the rest of us were using the unrestrained power of information technology to uh, buy and sell pixel art. In March, Americans finally received their $1,400 stimmy checks from old man Biden, who should have probably spent his own check on a Stairmaster for Air Force One. On the online, though, dollars are just Disney bucks to be exchanged for internet money, bitch. The price of Bitcoin broke above 60k for the first time, as a month before, Reddit-based investors short-squeezed GameStop and AMC for all it was worth. GME is my home! Diamond hand, bitch! I'm never selling! I don't give a- Popular gaming platform Roblox listed on the American stock market, allowing investors to profit from the creativity of nine-year-olds. Child labor's gone digital, baby! But it turned out the real grift was selling JPEGs to tax-dodging Russian oligarchs. March saw the sale of Beeple's Every Day is the First 5,000 Days for $69 million. And we're watching the closing of the auction, which closes in an hour and 18 minutes. It's already at like a absolutely ridiculous $69 million. I'm going to Disney World! Before this, Beeple was just a struggling digital artist, barely scraping a living the week before when he sold a 10 second video for a measly $6.6 .6 million. Every Days became the third highest sale for the work of a living artist at auction, just behind an actual IRL painting of a guy in a swimming pool and a $91 million stainless steel rabbit. Boy, the art world gets my hammer and sickle senses twitching. What made Every Days such a bargain, though, is that it wasn't just one art, it was 5,000 arts. With such masterpieces as Tom Hanks fighting the coronavirus, Disney intellectual property regurgitated on Mars, and an ocean spray commercial. <laughs> and if that bargain wasn't enough, it also came with its own non-fungible token. Back then, the Beeple sale represented the height of the mounting NFT mania, a trend that I sagely predicted would last about as long as the servers that NFTs are stored on. The great thing about digital goods, though, is that you can send them in an email attachment, unlike physical shit that you have to get delivered to you on giant, oil-guzzling container ships. On the 2nd of March, the Ever Given got stuck like a Dorito in the throat of the global supply chain. The ginormous dinghy refused to budge from the Suez Canal, a tight, wet, slutty little passage that usually accommodates 12% of the world's global trade and 50 large ships a day. At first, the only team on the scene were an Egyptian digger crew, who had the gargantuan task of single-handedly saving the world's shopping basket. An international incident that the entire internet agreed was objectively hilarious. Heavy oil-guzzling container ships queued up for over a week before the ship was finally dislodged by the diggers and dozens of tugboats. 
But the internet wasn't pleased, as everyone logged on to Twitter to make the same joke about wanting them to put the ship back where it was, congesting global trade and keeping us all amused. Revealing the unconscious desire that we all had to continue to be distracted by this, so we didn't have to think about all the other horrible shit that was happening. In early April, Elon Musk's Neuralink put a computer chip in a monkey's brain and taught him to play Pong with a banana smoothie dispenser. Which I don't really have anything to say about, I just really wanted to write that sentence. Besides, by the end of the month, a whole army of brain-dead primates had taken the internet by storm. The Bored Ape Yacht Club set sail on April 30th, selling 10,000 slightly different JPEGs of the same fucking monkey. Sales totaled at $2.8 million, as NFT grifters took to the open seas to sling their shit at one another and sell them for even more inflated prices. Despite looking like crudely drawn gorillas fan art, the Bored Ape Club proved that NFT mania was far from over, leading people like me to react to this with dignity and humility. April was also scam coin season, as the crypto frenzy of previous months birthed another load of shit coins from the internet's unlimited piggy bank. Yeah, Safe Moon! Woo! Coins like Safe Moon took off with the help of internet influencers like Keemstar and Jake Paul. Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy also got involved, backing Safe Moon after much baseball hat based deliberation. The answer is safe mode. Why? I don't know fucking why. It could be a Ponzi scheme. I like the word moon because that's where I want to go. Safe moon subsequently clattered back to earth as chump change, along with 100 other scam coins backed by influencers. The crypto world has seen a broad repeat of its 2017 peak, where coin creators and influencers get together to pull the rug out from under their established audiences. Ding Doing is so much more than a meme coin, it's a multimedia coin. Cartoon meets crypto. It's the blockchain, baby. There's some things you still can't do online, but crypto Ponzi schemes still ain't one of them. There was less good stuff to watch online in May, as LiveLeak, the video sharing site where you can see Syrian sniper compilations and factory workers getting their shins turned to paste, finally went offline for good. RIP Live Leak. In less sad news, Bill and Melinda Gates announced that they were getting divorced, and they'd been having some difficulties since it was revealed that Billy Boy had been cashing cum coupons on the Lolita Express. Allegedly. But it was another billionaire who was making more headlines in May, as it was truly the month of Musk. After the nearly not explosive landing of the Starship SN10 in March, SpaceX's 16 story SN15 performed a perfect dismount on the 6th of May. Back in March, Elon had also launched the price of Dogecoin up 75% with a single tweet, only to send it crashing back down to Earth again in May with his cringe inducing appearance on SNL. I keep telling you, it's a cryptocurrency you can trade for conventional money. Oh! So it's a hustle. Yeah, it's a hustle. <laughs> Why didn't you say that, man? The price of Dogecoin sank, angering the most annoying teenagers on the internet and pretty much no one else. Elon also used the opportunity to announce that he had Asperger's syndrome, which the internet reacted to with a shrug and a collective, eh, I feel like I already knew that. At the end of May, Elon's incredible Starlink satellite system was visible around the world traveling across the sky like a celestial pearl necklace. And it is a terrific and novel way to provide internet access to the remotest parts of the world. Even though there's only 21 countries that can actually access it at the moment. And yeah, light pollution, blah, 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 whatever. But come on, it's the internet in the bloody sky. I, I don't know, I thought it was cool. Even if you were connected to Starlink in June though, you may have had trouble finding some of your favorite early 2000s YouTube hits. Iconic YouTube video, Charlie Bit My Finger, was put up for sale as an NFT, and was subsequently deleted from the platform at the behest of its new owner. And you see, 
that's the great democratizing thing about NFTs. It's all about ownership, baby. Making art is hard, but any idiot can own something. As summer started, the Delta variant was popping lungs in every hemisphere. The legacy media was failing to keep people engaged with all their sad graphs. Ever since their biggest cash cow boogeyman had failed to secure a second term, American broadcast news media had been suffering from seriously declining viewing figures. Cable news now only exists to confirm the opinions of the over 50s, and to use the space in between to sell them pills to thin their blood and stiffen their winkled winkies. And with the coronavirus having just as much success targeting their targeted demographic, it was strange that the British media elite decided that it was prime time to make a whole new channel just for them. Now a severely dehydrated kitten is lucky to be alive after enduring baking temperatures trapped in the back of a furniture lorry for nearly a week. Here in the UK, the only thing that's more common than coronavirus or corruption is people's desire to try to claw back some of the glory of yesteryear. Which is why it made total sense for 30-year news veteran Andrew Neil to become the melting face of GB News. GB News will not be yet another echo chamber for the metropolitan mindset that already dominates so much of our media. Essentially pitched as Fox News for all the divorcee dads of the British Isles who haven't discovered Ben Shapiro in the YouTube algorithm yet. Though the channel's shoestring budget started to fray pretty early on with some embarrassing technical whoopsies. Welcome back to Tonight Live. It is 10 p.m. Due to the ongoing travel restrictions, so a day of action is being held by the UK travel. Sorry, I'm laughing because it's like banging. <laughs> Joy, having you on. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. Thanks for uh, reflecting about all that. Anyway, Neil started off the brand new channel declaring that this weren't your daddy's new. Well, it no, it, it was your daddy's news, but it was for the common folk. We are committed to covering the people's agenda, not the media's agenda. We will encourage debate and conversation to include voices you don't often hear on other news broadcasts. You see, it's the news of the people, presented to you by the former chairman of The Spectator, former editor of The Times, and founding chairman of Sky News. The channel's viewership plummeted in the first few months, and Andrew Neil swiftly disappeared to spend more time in his retirement castle in France. The channel was forced to pivot and take on a angrier, more conspiratorial tone, aiming to cause as much online offence as possible to try and feed viewers back to the analogue idiot box. In July, the ocean was literally on fire, in a sign of the apocalypse that we've all subsequently forgotten. TikTok allowed their users to extend their videos to up to three minutes, taking the attention span of Gen Z to unprecedented heights. By the end of the summer and for the rest of the year, TikTok would dethrone Google as the most visited website in the world. The EU also rolled out their vaccine passport program, allowing the vaccinated to cross European borders with the help of QR codes. The unvaccinated, though, remained incontinent, with the French positively shitting themselves at the prospect of spending another year in France. Personally, I was actually quite busy in July. I had a lot on. As a result, I didn't, I didn't really feel like doing much work. And it turns out that a lot of people have been feeling the same way. In the USA, people were hitting and quitting it at unprecedented levels in 2021. Posts were being abandoned in nearly every sector, especially in low-paying service industries such as hotels, restaurants, and childcare. This is for Laurel. I just want to say, fuck you, bitch. You stupid, dumb bitch. Wait, what? You're not going to talk to me like this because fuck you, and I quit. Fuck you and suck my dick. With nary enough nugget shufflers to keep Sonic Burger open, it was being referred to as a labour shortage. Which is a bit like referring to a crude oil shortage as a Saudi Prince supercar shortage. The labour is still out there, it's just not being exploited by the industry that have grown fat on a previously eager supply of it. A Dr. Anthony Klotz coined the term the Great Resignation, with many people blaming the pandemic and those frivolous stimmy checks that everyone had already spent. 
Others argue that it is just a reasonable reaction to stagnating wages and the spiraling cost of staying upright. Inflation has made low-wage jobs not just unappealing, but also unviable. With the rising cost of gas, sometimes the commute to a part-time job is self-defeating. <laughs> You're done. You're done. A record 4 million people quit their jobs in the month of August alone. And they gathered, as the unemployed often do, on Reddit, in the anti-work subreddit. A place not just to vent job-related frustration, but to also express a general apathy with working at all. A similar online movement, or lack thereof, also took hold in China. The Tangping, or Lie Flat phenomenon, began on the Chinese internet to protest the country's grueling work hours and diminishing opportunities for high-status government jobs. It may well have begun with this post, where a young man expressed the inner peace he'd found working on a small salary as a corpse for Chinese movies. Tang Ping is less of a protest and more of a, uh, a lifestyle, centered on anti-materialism and a rejection of the intense competition found in many Chinese workplaces. Europe too has been hit by the big quit, with the famously hard-working Germans resigning in record numbers. Among them was Angela Merkel, who ended her 16 years as Chancellor with this bizarre military send-off, which should all remind us not to take our eyes off the Germans for too long. By November, UK job vacancies had reached 2.7 million, which is astounding in a country with 70 million people. Sadly, the position of Prime Minister remains occupied by a tennis sock filled with chewed crayons. By the end of the year, the USA's great resignation was looking like more than just an excuse to stay home. When Kellogg's attempted to fill striker positions in December, the anti-work subreddit finally got off their ass and decided to do something, encouraging users to overwhelm the Kellogg's website with fake applications, crashing it in the process. And union support is as high as it was in the 1960s, when all those cool-ass gangsters ran them. Now they're run by dweeby, class-conscious millennials, who somehow managed to unionize the first Starbucks ever in this uplifting viral video. Which brings us to August, which was a particularly historic month. Which is why I've revived Dead Channel Internet Geography... Sorry, Internet Historian to tell us all about it. Afghan? Is this about the dog or the blanket or the biscuit? There's a country? Alright, well on the 15th of August 2021, the Taliban was rolling through Afghanistan like a biscuit rolling down a blanket. After a 20-year hiatus, the Taliban were tally unbanned and they were back in town. The American military had withdrawn, so there was little resistance. Within days, they owned the place. And how did they celebrate? With selfies on social media, of course. Posting holiday snaps. Look, look, I'm holding up the Capitol building. Occupying the streets. But also, occupying the fairground. Occupying the bumper cars. No girls allowed. Americans also left behind a bunch of gym equipment, so the Taliban occupied that too to show off their epic gains over the last 20 years. Now, while most people were fleeing for their lives, there was one British holidaymaker heading in the other direction. Kabul has fallen? Bet the airfares are cheap as chips. This man's name was Lord Miles. Or as us Australians would say, kilometers. Miles had taken a flight to Kabul to do some sightseeing and maybe see some locals. When are you joining the Taliban? Uh, I don't know. Um, when they're more based. Ha. <laughs> Jokes. He would keep a vlog and report to 4chan with updates. Look, I was walking around Afghanistan with a pink phone cable. So, you know, the Taliban want to kill like, you know, LGBT people, right? So, if I was walking around this and I look like, you know, I look like a baby. And if anything went wrong, technically, on his credit card, it says Lord Miles, even though he's not really a lord in any sort of way. But they will think that he's minor nobility and therefore valuable as ransom. So, worst case, he ends up a high value hostage, more likely to be treated to tea and Afghan biscuits, then concluding his vlog with a beheading. 
On the surface, he seemed to have a great time. But as the Taliban's grip on the country tightened, the situation got spicier for miles. So they just think they're going to kill me. So we just literally turn around the car, we speed away. And then everyone starts getting traffic. We abandoned the car, we started running. And then eventually I buy, um, I buy a burka, I stick one on, and it's really hot. So people just think I'm a woman. Eventually, he conceded that he needed to sneak a flight home from Kabul airport. And so he did. And he even bought terrorism insurance before the trip, so he got a bunch of his ticket money back. In September, Netflix released their newest, most popular show ever, Squid Game. A really pretty great show with a killer concept, instantly iconic set design, and butt-clenching tension. Internet commentators, though, were more concerned with whether the show confirms their preconceived biases or not. With beanie crybaby Tim Pool insistent that a show about winning a large sum of money was actually about communism. And they're fighting each other because they're starving. That to me is an indictment of communism. And if this guy who made the show is actually like, it's, it's actually capitalism that's bad, I'm like, it just goes to show this is a person who made a great show but was really dumb and didn't understand they were actually critiquing yeah. communism. It's proving that media literacy on the internet is still in its infancy, with people still unable to enjoy things unless they also agree with them. If you are desperate for a story about capitalism gone crazy though, you only had to look to El Salvador and their new Bitcoin bro president. Nayib Bukele assumed power in 2019 and has since spent his time in office radically reducing gang violence in the small Central American country, possibly by making deals with the gangs themselves. But you know what they say, if you can't beat them, bribe them. This year though, he made waves when he declared that Bitcoin would officially become legal tender in El Salvador alongside the US dollar. The Bitcoin system is so perfect that I think it's going to be the future. Handing out $30 worth to every citizen in the country, as well as using the country's treasury to buy millions worth of Bitcoin, sometimes on his phone and sometimes in the nude. El Presidente even threw a party for his citizens slash investors in November. Donning his signature backwards baseball cap, he got on stage to announce he was building a new coin-shaped Bitcoin city at the base of a volcano. He also claimed that the city would get heating from the geothermal power of the volcano itself. So that Bitcoin city will be a circle that will encode a new volcano. It's not a new volcano, but a new volcano. It's been not the same volcano that's powering the mine. It's another one. So at the beginning, we will power the city with the old volcano and the old, old uh, power plant. But then we will build a new one right next to the city. So we were talking about building a park before, but that, that idea is gone. We're not building the park. I thought we are building a park. No, no, we're not. Sorry, sorry. But you've got to admit, the guy is ahead of the curve. By tying El Salvador's fortunes to the blockchain, he is leading the way. And it's only a matter of time before other countries follow suit. In October, Denis Villeneuve's Dune was released in cinemas and on HBO Max and on torrenting sites simultaneously. Before I'd even watched the movie, I'd already seen a hundred memes of the film's breakout star chanting incoherent nonsense. But Dave Chappelle was truly the Kizat Hadarak of droning on and on about the same shit in his controversial stand-up special, The Closer which featured some long-winded and not very funny segments about how he was being cancelled for transphobia during a special he was being paid several million dollars to perform. While cancel culture isn't quite cancelled, I think this year we've seen its influences starting to wane. But ever behind the times, that didn't stop Congress from trying to cancel Facebook itself. Former Facebook product manager Francis Haugen turned corporate snitch, taking the stand in Congress to air out the House of Zuck's dirtiest laundry. The documents I have provided to Congress prove that Facebook has repeatedly misled the public about what its own research reveals about the safety of children. But I'm here today because I believe Facebook's products harm children. But we will not allow your company to harm our children. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Congress was apparently very concerned with the threat that Facebook posed to children, catching up with the cultural zeitgeist of 2007. Really, the kids are alright. 
It's their grandparents who are being convinced in Facebook groups to drink bleach and chow down on horse dewormer. The American Association of Poison Control Centers reported 1,440 cases of ivermectin poisoning through to September 2021, a threefold increase compared to previous years. Thanks to info shared in Facebook groups and through their recommendation algorithm, anti-vax anuses are now completely worm-free. But I would argue that Facebook has bigger worms to scrape. The same internal documents that Francis was citing also shows that teenagers are abandoning Facebook's platform in their droves. So much so that their American user base could decrease by up to 45% in just two years. So the Zuck decided the best way to heal his company's declining public image was simply to escape into a fictional world of his own creation and take us all along for the ride. As you probably remember, because it was only recently, Facebook is now officially meta. The next platform and medium will be even more immersive, an embodied internet where you're in the experience, not just looking at it. That's right, the metaverse is upon us, collapsing that formerly one meter gap between you and your screen. Now you're inside the web and it's all over your face. In the metaverse, the only limits are those of your imagination. And Mark quickly showed the limits of his own. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. All right, perfect. The metaverse is Mark's pitch for Web.3 by way of virtual reality. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Mark. Hi. Hi, Mark. What's up, Mark? <laughs> Boz, is that you? Of course it's me. You know I had to be the robot, man. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> Personally, I'm not convinced. Weirdos like me will be happy to strap a screen to their head, but I don't think the normies will go for it. For those of you who have relationships that aren't parasocial and friends who aren't cartoon avatars... Ah, uh, we're not friends. Oh, well. For those of you who have friends, the metaverse isn't just for immersive head-mounted jerkathons. It's also about AR, or augmented reality. Yeah. You're here! <laughs> Why hang out in real life when you can hang out with the ghostly apparitional approximation of your real friends? And why fight your inner demons when you can fight cyber spirits in an AR ghost world fencing sesh? As for the AR stuff, it's highly dependent on great leaps in hologram-based technology, which to my knowledge is still just sci-fi flimflam. Mark was also keen to point out the various ways to integrate payment models and, yeah, NFTs. Love the movement. Wait, it's it's disappearing. This is amazing. Hold on, I'll tip the artist and they'll extend it. Wow. This is at least one way that the metaverse seems viable in 2021. It's a world where we've become so divorced from reality, we can no longer ascertain the value of the digital from the material. However, if you look beyond Mark's VR foiling sesh and or hubris, there were actually some pretty good ideas for where VR might be headed. There is Horizon Worlds, which is where you can build worlds and jump into them with people. Horizon is designed to make it possible for everyone to create, and we're already seeing people build some really interesting experiences, from creating new games together, to throwing surprise parties in VR that family and friends around the world can join. Now this, I think, is probably the future of virtual reality. User-created worlds monetized for the creators. And in a work-from-home world where people are progressively collaborating across continents, the professional possibilities of VR cannot be ignored. I'm not sure if this is the future of the web as a whole, but it's a fascinating space that's only gonna get fascinating, uh... Lots of things probably happened in November, but I was busy giving a TEDx talk in Vienna and filming stuff for a video in LA that I still haven't posted yet. As I wasn't really paying attention, instead here I will be talking about video games and the consensus that this has been a disappointing year for AAA releases. The year started out relatively strong, with the latest in Agent 47's high-octane toilet-drowning adventures. The lavish level design and sick-as-hell violence, though, was slightly undercut by the same problem my channel had this year. Not enough content. 
Resident Evil 5 was righteous and bodacious in equal measure. Time loop games like Deathloop, Returnal, and The Forgotten City kept repeating on us, and were somehow less repetitive than Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Cyberpunk still feels unfinished, but isometric shooter The Ascent surprised with an immersive yet grindy cyberpunk substitute. Something that I probably wouldn't have played if it wasn't for Xbox Game Pass, which is definitely looking like the Netflix of games and the future of the industry. The original GTA trilogy, though, somehow got less finished, with their buggy mobile game spit and polish featuring the lumpiest characters this side of Chernobyl. Rockstar apparently doesn't care enough for its past, which is a shame with remakes like the Mass Effect trilogy and the 15 year late sequel to Psychonauts prove that there is value in revisiting it. Then again, with limp, uninspired legacy shooters dominating the release schedule, it feels like the whole industry is trying to get into a time loop all the way back to 2008. Admittedly, Halo Infinite was one welcomed retread, with the campaign playing like a modern update of Halo Combat Evolved. Its perfectly balanced multiplayer maps, satisfying weapons loadouts, and grappling shenanigans hooked me so hard that I now can't sleep without hearing its menu music softly playing somewhere deep in my cerebellum. I don't want a lot for Christmas. On December 1st, Jack Dorsey announced that he was stepping down as CEO of Twitter so that he could spend more time with his Twitter. The honkies over at Twitch decided to ban some of their biggest creators for using the world's most vanilla slur. The Omicron variant spread holiday despair as people struggled to pronounce the reason they couldn't spend Christmas with grandma. And Chile got itself a new president. 35-year-old Gabriel Borit. Fuck. Ugh, cat! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. Good, one more month to go. My throat's a bit sore, but it's fine. And Chile got itself a new president. 35-year-old Gabriel Boric, another baseball-hatted, terminally online leader who was swept to victory on a set of absolutely bonkers Shrek-related memes. <laughs> Against all my hopes and predictions, NFT mania reached a mainstream zenith by the end of the year, as the global market for non-fungibles reached $22 billion. The likes of Quentin Tarantino, Melania Trump, and Snoop Dogg were all hocking their own crypto trading cards. And Stanley's digital corpse even got the weekend at Bernie's treatment. NFTs are all about ownership. That's their whole point. There's a reason that most of the successful projects are either computer generated or remixes of already recognizable IP. If anyone still thinks they're empowering digital artists, they're either kidding themselves or they're in on the grift. Along with VR and the blockchain, NFTs are being touted as a stepping stone to Web 3.0. And yes, the web does need to reclaim a new space that isn't dominated by corporate-owned platforms. But a technology that validates ownership isn't the way to get there. It will just create a new hierarchy that will be dominated again by venture capital and scam artists. The jump from Web 1 to Web 2 was all about user interaction. You didn't just read shit. You liked stuff, commented, engaged, and you were rewarded with a personal feed catered to you. The next seismic evolution of the internet, whatever it is, will have to offer a new level of control and engagement, and yeah, sure, maybe ownership, but over what you create, not what someone else has sold to you. Which is why YouTube's decision to hide dislikes was so disappointing. In November, YouTube announced that they were going to start hiding public dislikes in order to protect creator mental health, following through in December. Considering you already have to be mentally compromised to start a YouTube channel seemed like a bit of a moot point, but okay, let's see their reasoning. Apparently groups of viewers are targeting a video's dislike button to drive up the count, turning it into something like a, a, a game with a visible scoreboard and it's usually just because they don't like the creator or what they stand for. Yeah, that's that's what disliking things means. That's a big problem when half of YouTube's mission is to give everyone a voice. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, give everyone a voice. Except for the people watching the video? 
You can still dislike videos and that action will be used to tune your own recommendations, but you won't be able to see the dislike count. Only the creator can find it on the back end if they want. Wait, we can still see the dislikes? What? Let me just check on this. Oh no! My mental health! It's declining! What makes online media different from other forms is the inbuilt democracy and audience engagement. Comments aren't just commentary to content, they are part of it. They are there to correct, communicate, and compare your hair to Guy Fieri's. The like to dislike ratio is a voting system. It's what tells you if a tutorial works, or if you're going to be scammed, or if the creator is a lying piece of shit. Dislikes are a necessary evil that keep user-generated content in check, and I sincerely hope that next year YouTube sees the error of its ways. By the time you're watching this video, it's probably already 2022. Maybe it's 2024. How's it going? Did I survive the pandemic, slash Russian oil war, slash ape uprising? Who knows what surprises 2022 will have in store for us. Maybe that big space telescope thing will confirm the existence of extraterrestrial life. Maybe Mike Tyson will cure coronavirus. Maybe, just maybe, we'll finally be able to download soup. Whatever happens, I think there are reasons to be optimistic. Human history kind of curves towards greater cooperation. And you're watching this on the internet, the greatest tool for information dispersal and organization since cave dudes invented mouth noises. Don't take your access to it for granted. Don't let the bastards grind you down. And don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time in 2022. Whew, I'm done.